So the next section we're going to talk about is mass spectrometry. Uh, and this is how we analyze molecules based on their molecular mass. Now, it, it's actually a little bit more exact than that, and we'll get to that. So let's, let's first break down and look at a mass spectrometer from a very simple perspective. So mass spectrometer has an ionizing chamber. And what happens here is we have some way of injecting our sample into the chamber through some port. Uh, once it's in there, we heat our sample to vaporize it and uh, get it into the gas phase. The whole thing is under pretty high vacuum, so it's very low pressure. Uh, we have an electron source, and what this electron source does, you'll see in just a second, that actually ionizes your sample. It collides with the sample, it knocks an electron out, and you end up with a positively charged uh, cation. Uh, that cation then goes through an electric field that accelerates it and when it accelerates it goes through a magnetic field and the magnetic field will cause that particle beam to curve based on the mass of the particles. Lighter particles will get curve a lot uh, as they go through the magnetic field and heavier particles will curve less through that magnetic field. The amount that they get deflected depends on the mass to charge ratio. So when they get to the other end, they will hit a detector and this thing basically counts ions. The detector counts the number of ions, but where it hits on this detector, the lighter elements will hit over here on the left hand side in this instance and the heavier elements will hit over here on the right hand side. So we can get something known as a mass spectrum based on the mass of the uh, ion that goes through. Uh, uh, and, and again, the heavier ions here, the lighter ions here, based on that mass to charge ratio. You can adjust parameters, you can adjust the electric field to uh, speed up the time of flight of those ions. You can adjust the magnetic field to make sure that it deflects within a range of this detector. And then you also have to have that detector calibrated. So what is the result of all of that? Well, the result is you get a mass spectrum. But let's take a look again at what's going on as we uh, our sample enters the chamber. So the sample enters the chamber. Uh, the high energy electron beam is used to collide with the sample. It knocks an electron out. So we can think of an equation where we have a molecule plus a high energy electron. It will knock an electron out. So you end up with two electrons, the one that impacted uh, and the one that gets knocked out. You then have this molecular ion, a radical cation. So all you do is take a, a compound and knock an electric out, uh, electron out. So for example, here we have propane. We put it in our sample. Uh, we hit it with our ionization source. There's other ways to ionize molecules, but we're just going to talk about electron impact. Uh, it collides with the propane molecule and forms the propane radical cation. And then that goes through the mass spectrometer and it will get deflected. But there's something else that occurs and it's actually very diagnostic uh, for a mass spectrometry. Uh, here we see the mass spectrum of propane. So propane has a molecular uh, mass. Let's take a look at the various things on this uh, spectrum. So A, that is the axis in units of mass to charge ratio. We often think of it just in terms of mass. Okay, so this will tell us how heavy the things we detect on. You can, you can think of this as being a picture of that detector with the heavier atoms hitting over here and the lighter uh, molecules, the, I'm sorry, the lighter uh, cations getting deflected more and hitting the de detector over here. So we see that we may have expected to just see one line that corresponded to the mass of propane that actually we'll find out in a minute is right there but we see a bunch so we're going to have to figure out what that means the y-axis just represents the relative abundance of each detected ion so each one of these ions represented by a bar represents the number 
that have hit that detector of that mass to charge ratio. And the mass to charge ratio uh, can be, we, we think of it just in terms of the mass. So there's a bunch of heavy ones that hit here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of light ones that hit here. In mass spectrometry, we talk about the base peak. The base peak is the highest peak that appears in the spectrum. It doesn't need to be the heaviest. It's the one that has the biggest number of ions impact the detector. So it's an ion count. And in this case, it's this fragment C that uh, turns out to be our base peak. Then everything is relative to that. The base peak is put at 100% and everything else will be something less than 100%. One of the higher value mass to charge peaks may or may not represent the molecular ion. And we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, and what we're going to learn is that the original sample actually breaks apart. And that really gives us a lot of information. So typically, uh, the, the heaviest peak, uh, the heaviest significant peak is often our molecular ion. So this, in this case, this corresponds to the radical cation of propane. This then, this base peak, is some fragment of that because it breaks apart. And finally, the small peaks that are one or two mass units higher than the molecular mass of our sample are due to isotopes in the diff various atoms. For instance, uh, what, what we're going to find is this is our base peak that corresponds to the propane radical cation, there's this little peak here at E, that's because some of the molecules will have some carbon-13 in them. 1% of all carbon is carbon-13. Most carbon is carbon-12. So that's what a mass spectrum looks like. This is just a mass spectrum of propane. Now let's take a little look what's going on here. So this is the propane radical cation. Remember, we started off with just propane. We hit it with a uh, high energy beam of electrons uh, and knocked an electron out and formed this radical cation. This radical cation then, uh, it can travel and go all the way to the detector, but many of these molecules will break apart. So if we think about propane, And remember, we've knocked one electron out, so we actually have this radical cation. Well, it can break. We can uh, break one of these bonds. Now, it doesn't matter. There's two carbon-carbon bonds that can break. Uh, they'll both give the same types of fragments. But the electrons can break such that both electrons go over here uh, to give us two fragments we can have an ethyl cation and a methyl radical. Or we can have an ethyl radical and a methyl cation. The detector only sees cations in this case. So these never reach the detector because they're neutral and they don't get deflected by the magnetic field. They just run into the wall of that uh, mass spectrometer tube. Only the charged species will get deflected by the magnetic field and curve around and hit the detector. So these neutral species are invisible to the mass spectrometer. We only see, that's important, and you guys will forget that, but it's very important. So we see a peak here due to the ethyl cation, and another peak due to the ethyl cation. So the detector only sees these species that I'm highlighting in yellow. So uh, let's go back here and look at the peak. This corresponds to the propane radical cation, and this corresponds to the 
ethyl cation. The ethyl cation has a mass of 29. And we see down here this peak is at a mass of 29. This peak is at a mass of 41, 2, 3, 4, 44. Which is the molecular mass for propane. Now remember, we don't see propane. We see the radical cation because it's charged. It's a charged species. So again, we see that. And we see that. And the methyl radical, which would be CH3+, plus, we see it as well, but notice we only see a small amount of it here at 15, okay? A couple of things for most organic compounds. What we'll learn is that most of the time, the parent ion has an even numbered molecular mass. Uh, and when it fragments, you get odd numbers for the fragmentation. So the ethyl cation and the methyl cation both have odd numbers. Uh, 12 for carbon, 1 for each hydrogen is 15. So there we go. We see the spectrum and we see it breaks up. So the spectrum is very diagnostic of the compound that we're looking at. Now here's uh, a compound. Notice now that the base peak and the molecular ion peak are the same. They're right here. That's the base peak. And it's also what we call the M plus peak. The, we'll often just call it M plus like this. Formally, remember, it's a radical cation. We knocked an electron out of, in this case, benzene. And we have the benzene radical cation. And as it goes about, it deflects. And uh, we see this peak at 78 which is the molecular mass. It's actually the, the uh, mass number uh, for benzene. And we'll get to the differences between molecular mass, mass number, and exact mass a little bit later. Uh, so it's 78, and then it also breaks up. Now, notice the base peak and the molecular ion are the same peak in the case of benzene. That's because there's not much for it to fragment into. Let's take a look at something that breaks apart um, in a predictable fashion. Let's take a look at hexane. So hexane goes through and we form the hexane radical cation, which I'm going to draw here, CH3, CH2, 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 1, 2, 3, 4 carbon, 5 carbon, 6 carbon. and uh, if we add it up, we have 6 times 12, 72, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, hydrogens. We have 14 hydrogens, 2, 4, 6, 8, 14 hydrogens. So it has a mass of 86, 12 for each carbon and 1 for each of the hydrogens. And notice we have this little peak down here. We call this the M plus 1 peak. Okay, and this is our M plus peak. I suppose formally we should call it the M plus plus one. Uh, that's due to things that have an isotope. Mostly it's due to a molecule that happens to have a carbon 13 uh, in that molecule. Every once in a while it may be a deuterium, but deuterium is very low abundance. Carbon 13 actually has an abundance of greater than 1%. So uh, that's very diagnostic and we're gonna learn that in a little bit. But this thing also breaks apart. It can break apart by breaking off this bond and giving a methyl radical and a pentyl cation. We will see the pentyl cation, and that's our M plus minus 15. The radical that broke off has a mass of 15 atomic units, and the remaining fragment, the pentyl cation, has a mass of 71. And that's what's detected. So it will get deflected more and 
we can tell the difference between that fragment and this fragment. Notice now this base peak is actually due to this fragmentation where uh, we get a butyl cation and an ethyl radical. Where it fragments is going to base, be based on the thermodynamics of the fragmentation. Now we know that secondary cations are more stable than primary cations. As it turns out, secondary radicals are also more stable than primary radicals. So this breaks such that it gives a secondary cation and a secondary radical. That's much more thermodynamically favorable than giving a secondary cation and a primary, I'm sorry, these are primary cations and a methyl uh, radical. Uh, but, so that's why this is such a small peak is because you have to form that methyl cation. As soon as we start breaking these other bonds, here, here, and here, we get a secondary, I'm sorry, we get a primary cation and a primary radical, and we don't get any methyl radicals. Now, notice in this instance, we see all of these, uh, we see our parent peak, and then we see a whole bunch of secondary radicals. We see the uh, pentyl, the butyl, the propyl, uh, and the ethyl. But we don't see a peak at 15. It's missing because that is just so thermodynamically unfavorable compared to all the other reactions that we can see. Uh, it's so minute. It happens, but it's so minute we don't even see it in the noise. So notice now we see all of these different cations. These are the things we see in the mass spec, all of these things in yellow, and these things in red, we don't see because they're invisible to the technique. So we see a cluster here. Oops, let's, uh, let's change that. We see a cluster here, we see a cluster here, we see a cluster here and here with the biggest peak of those clusters being the one that we see. These other things can other things can occur and give other fragments, but these are the ones that are easily explainable. So we can analyze the molecular ion peak. The first step in a mass spec is to identify the molecular peak. When you identify the molecular ion peak, that gives you the mass of the molecule you're looking at. So if our molecular ion is this thing, one, two, three, four, five, uh, pentane would have a mass of 72. We would expect to see a significant peak for that 72. It may not be the mass peak like it wasn't here. This 86 wasn't the base peak, but it was a significant peak. And it's also the heaviest peak. So the heaviest peak may be the molecular ion. It may not be as well because the molecular ion may be so uh, unstable that it just breaks up and we don't see it. So we have to be careful. And uh, one of the things that's nice is most of the time, your molecular ion peak should be an even numbered mass. Uh, we'll get to the few instances that it's not. So when you see an even numbered mass, you know it's probably your molecular ion peak, uh, if it's the biggest mass as well. Okay, if we happen to have uh, this species, which has one nitrogen in it, it actually has an odd number and your molecular mass would uh, be an odd number ion. Uh, you would have other ways of knowing if there was nitrogen in there. And if you knew there was nitrogen in there and you saw an odd number ion, you'd know that you have one, three, five, seven, an odd number of nitrogens. If you knew you had nitrogen in your molecule and you saw an even number, then you would know that you have at least two, maybe four, six, eight, an even number of nitrogens. And we'll talk about that later. So the biggest, the most useful piece of information uh, initially is the mass. Okay, so once we know the mass, we can generate some possible species. Uh, what are the way of generating possible molecular formulas from a known mass? 
is to use this thing called the rule of 13. And from the rule of 13, once we know a mass number, we can generate potential hydrocarbon fragments by dividing our mass by 13. And then you have to use the remainder. And I hope you folks know what the remainder is. Remember, for example, 5 divided by 2 gives us 2 with a remainder of 1. Uh, 11 divided by 2 gives us a, a quotient of 5 with a remainder of 1. Okay? And so it's not the decimal bit on your calculator that's the remainder. Uh, it's the actual remainder. So the molecular formula that you can generate from that is right here. Your carbons are the number uh, that you get, the initial quotient. Uh, M divided by 13 gives N, and that tells you the number of carbons. And then the number of hydrogens would be N plus the remainder. Uh, N plus R would give you the number of hydrogens. So for example, uh, We'll, we'll take a look at this rule of 13. So using the rule of 13. We generate, we use a mass spec, and we find that the molecular mass for our compound has a mass for the molecular ion of 106. So... All we have to do is divide 106 by 13. 13 goes into 106. Uh, as it turns out, it goes in there eight times, and it has a remainder of two. So we can generate a molecular formula for that, a hydrocarbon formula, CN, which is eight, and H, N plus R, which gives us 10. So using this rule of 13, and this is important, you're going to have to know how to do this, it's going to appear in this test, gives us a uh, mass, I'm sorry, gives us a molecular formula of C8H10. Now, does that mean our molecule is C8H10? It does not. It could be something else. Uh, so if we want to replace, let's say we know we have one oxygen in there. For some reason, we know that. Let's go back. Oxygen has a mass of 16, which is the same as CH4. So if we knew we had one oxygen in there, we would have to remove the equivalent of CH4. And here we see we've removed one carbon, we have seven. We remove four hydrogens, we have six, and we add our oxygen. This would also have a molecular mass of 106. Both of these have a molecular mass of 106, or a mass number. We'll get to that in a second. So you want to be careful when you're doing this. You want to make sure that uh, your molecule makes sense. So you, if you use the rule of 13 to calculate a hydrocarbon structure, for a compound with a mass of 76, you get a quotient of 5 and a remainder of 11. So that would tell us then that we have C5H16. You cannot have C5H16, right? The most hydrogen you can have in a C5 molecule is 12. So this makes no sense. So you know that you must have something else there. Maybe you have oxygen in there. And if you remove... Uh, if you put oxygen in there, we have to remove one carbon and four hydrogens and an oxygen. That now does make sense, right? We could have, this is possible, And this is impossible.
doesn't make sense. So let's go with what makes sense. Uh, again, the nitrogen rule is interesting because uh, if we have one nitrogen, we will have an odd atomic mass. If we have uh, two nitrogens, we'll have an even molecular mass. If we have three nitrogens, we'll have an odd molecular mass. So the nitrogen rule tells us that compounds containing an odd number of nitrogen have odd mass numbers. That's the nitrogen rule. If we have an even number of nitrogens, it will have an even mass number, as we see here. Note we're using mass numbers, not accurate masses or uh, average masses. We're using mass numbers. So do not use the average mass. Let's talk about that for a second. What are these different masses? The average mass, uh, what I'm calling the average mass, that's what you use when you're in the lab and you want to make a 5 molar solution. You take into account that there's different isotopes and you just use an average molecular mass. Some uh, methanes, for example, has uh, a mass of 16, uh, um, a mass number of 16, because we're assuming we have carbon 12 and four hydrogens, each with uh, a mass of one. But we could have a carbon 13. Every once, 1% 1 of our molecules will have a carbon 13 in them with methane. Uh, so it would actually have a mass number of 17. But on average, then your molecular mass takes into account that isotopic distribution. The mass number is uh, the number of protons and neutrons in an atomic nucleus. So carbon has two mass numbers, 12 and 13. Now, most often we will use uh, for our calculations the mass number for the uh, isotope that has the highest abundance. And for carbon, that happens to be 12. And for hydrogen, that happens to be 1. For oxygen, it's 16. Those are the mass numbers. Nitrogen, 14. Uh, the exact mass uh, is the exact mass. So, for example, if we do the average mass of uh, water, we take the average mass of hydrogen and the average mass of nitrogen, and we get 18.01528 Daltons for water. The, the exact mass, if we have H2O, the exact mass is slightly different than the average mass. Now, if we have heavy water, which is D2O, D being deuterium, that's the isotope of hydrogen that has a proton and a neutron, and it has a mass number of 2. The exact mass for heavy water is 20.0229, okay? But in mass spec, we typically use the mass number. So that's important. Let's, uh, let's highlight that in red, or blue, I guess it is. There we go. That's what we use for mass spec. Oops. Different uh, atoms have different isotopes. We've already talked about the fact that most carbon is carbon-12. In fact, almost 99% of carbon is, is uh, carbon-12. But 1%, slightly better than 1%, of carbon is carbon-13. So it has an average mass of, of 12 times 98% plus 13 times 100 times 1.07% divided um, by those numbers, we get a mass average. Uh, that's why the average mass is slightly different than the mass number or the exact mass. Hydrogen exists predominantly 99.99% as the isotope that only has a proton and no neutrons. But a very small amount, 0.011%, of hydrogen has a proton and a neutron in the nucleus, so it has a mass number of two. So we're going to stop there for right now.